the uh, narrative sequences in the Bible that I was speaking of <coughs> are of a type that that uh, <coughs> make it very difficult to a answer the question, are they histories or fictions? In fact, it might be said that what is distinctive, almost unique about the Bible, is the fact that that question cannot be directly answered at all. And uh, <clears throat> I said last day that every sequence in words, just by virtue of the fact that it has a sequence, is a verbal structure in which the verbs, in which the words have their own patterns and their own forms. It is impossible to describe anything with definitive accuracy in the outside world by means of words, because words are always forming their own self-contained patterns of subject and predicate and object. And they are continually shaping reality into what are essentially grammatical fictions. And I suggested that it doesn't matter whether a sequence of words is called a history or a story, that is, whether it is intended to follow a sequence of actual events or not, as far as its verbal shape is concerned, it will be equally mythical in either case. <clears throat> but we notice that any emphasis on shape or structure or pattern or form always throws a verbal narrative into the direction we call mythical rather than historical. To give you an example from the book of Judges. The book of Judges is <clears throat> a sequence of stories about leaders who were originally tribal leaders, but they've been edited to present the appearance of a united Israel going through a series of disasters and restorations. The actual heroes are different each time, Gideon, Jephthah, Sam Samson, Samuel, and the stories told about them naturally differ in content. But they're all set inside a similar framework. And that framework is Israel deserts its God, the result is disaster, an enemy moves in conquers the country or invades it. The uh, <clears throat> Israelites think better of their infidelity, turn back to their God again, a deliverer or a judge is sent, and he brings them back to a position where they, roughly where they were before. Now that gives you a narrative shape or pattern which you would get either in a history or in a work of literature. It wouldn't, wouldn't matter. It would be, you'd still have that. that. And the particular shape that you get is roughly a U shape. That is, you begin with infidelity. The result is bondage. Then there is the return, then there is the <coughs> deliverer or judge. Now that is the general shape of the typical story told in the book of Judges. And that U-shaped pattern is the typical shape of the structure we know as comedy. If you look at <clears throat> comedy, you find 
that a situation is presented in front of you which gradually becomes more ominous and threatening and foreboding of disaster to the, to the uh, characters that you are sympathetic with. But then there's a kind of gimmick or sudden shift in the plot. And eventually it moves towards a happy ending where everybody gets married and the hero and heroine's real life is assumed to begin after the play is over, which uh, is why the heroes and heroines of so many comedies are in fact rather dull people and the uh, main character interest is thrown on the blocking characters like the parents who forbid them to marry or something of that kind. <clears throat> now that is also the containing narrative shape of the Bible because the the mythical shape of the Bible, if you read it from beginning to end, is a comic shape. It's a story in which man is placed in a state of nature from which he falls. And the word fall is something which this diagram indicates. And then <clears throat> At the end of the story, he is restored to the things that he had at the beginning. There is the story of Israel, and Israel in the Old Testament is restored at the end of history, according to the way the prophets see that history. The Christian Bible is focused more on the story of Adam who represents mankind falling from a state of integration with nature into a state where he is alienated from nature. And in symbolic terms, what Adam loses is the tree and the water of life. Those are the images that we'll look at in more detail later. And on practically the first page of the Bible, you are told that Adam loses the tree and the water of life in the Garden of Eden. On practically the last page of the Bible, in the last chapter of the book of Revelation, the, the prophet has a vision of the tree and the water of life restored to man. <clears throat> now that affinity between the structure of the Bible and the structure of the Christian myth which is founded on it the affinity between that structure and the structure of comedy has been recognized for many centuries and is the reason why Dante called his vision of, of hell and purgatory and heaven a, a commedia. We owe our great tragedies very largely to the Greek tradition, <coughs> which uh, has a different outlook, which Professor Stobel will be explaining in the other half of this course. And <clears throat> we notice that the Bible is not very close to tragedy. When it deals with disaster, its point of view is ironic rather than tragic. Because, well, there are many reasons which we'll come to later. The main ones are that in the typical tragedy, you have a hero who suggests certain qualities which are superhuman and the Bible recognizes no such hero except for Jesus himself. The, the crucifixion would be the one genuine tragic form in the Bible, but that of course is an episode in a containing comedy. And this U-shaped pattern <clears throat> of loss and return and deliverance <clears throat> and ending with <clears throat> something of what you had before is found all the way through the Bible. It's not only the containing form, but you find it in many parts of the Bible that have nothing to do with history. It is, for example, a containing form of the story of Job, who 
is in a state of prosperity, loses everything he has, and at the end of the story is restored to what he had before. It is also the containing shape of Jesus' parable of the prodigal son, and it's perhaps interesting to notice that the prodigal son is the only version we have in the Bible of these loss and return stories where the decision to return is a voluntary act of the chief character himself. Uh, in Jesus' parable, the prodigal son says he is going to go back to where he was before, but he, that's, that's the only example. All the others depend on a human confession of helplessness and a divine intervention. <clears throat> now the next fact which links on to that is the fact that the central nation of the Bible story is Israel, and the most important historical fact about Israel is that the Israelites were never lucky at the game of empire. Uh, <clears throat> the land of Israel was simply a highway between Egypt and the Mesopotamian kingdoms, and In the entire historical record, there are only two very brief periods of relative prosperity and independence, the period of David and Solomon and the period just following the Maccabean Rebellion, about a century before the time of Christ. The reason was the same in both cases. One world empire had declined and its successor had not yet risen. The period of David and Solomon came between the decline of Egypt and the rise of Assyria, and the period of the Maccabees and their successors came between the decline of Syria and the rise of Rome. So we find that history is always in itself a problem for the biblical narrators. They are surrounded by kingdoms which are prosperous and powerful, and although they are often wicked, they seem to get away with it. And most of the biblical writers are writing within an Israel which desperately longs to have this kind of power and influence and prosperity, and would certainly regard it as a mark of signal dif divine favor if it ever did have it. But throughout the biblical story, it doesn't. So that you can look at the story of Israel mythically as a sequence of falls and rises. Sometimes the rise is only to a change of masters, but still that U-shaped pattern of decline and rise again is the way in which the story of Israel is told throughout the Bible. Now to mention all of these falls and rises at once would be confusing so I'll select six in honor of the days of creation. And we start, of course, with Adam and in Eden. And Adam is thrown out of Eden and is told to go and till the ground, which is cursed in order to make it more difficult. And so, from the garden, we are turned out into a wilderness. 
Now to that symbol of the wilderness, two other images are added. One is the image of the sea, which turns up in the story of Noah's flood. And the other is the symbol of the heathen city. The first person born outside the Garden of Eden is Cain, the eldest son of Adam. And Cain, you remember, is the murderer of Abel. He is sent into a far country, and there, there he founds a city. And that city has always been a puzzle to readers of Genesis who are reading a narrative which seems to imply that there are only three people alive in the world at that time. But what is interesting is the assumption that cities are the earliest form of human settlement rather than villages or hamlets or isolated far farms. So you can add the heathen city. Cain goes out to what is called the land of Nod, and we don't know where that is, but it looks as though it were somewhere in Mesopotamia. And we'll pass over the story of the flood for the moment, but the first upward movement, conspicuous upward movement, is the one associated with Abraham, who lives in a heathen city called Ur in Sumeria, and is drawn out of there by God and promised a land in the west. And then the patriarchs succeed. Abraham's son is Isaac, Isaac's son is Jacob, whose later name is Israel. And this period seems to be very largely a pastoral one associated with flocks and herds. That is, it seems to be essentially a ranching economy. And Abraham lives there, and then his grandson Jacob, Israel, as a result of a complicated story about his son Joseph, goes down into Egypt. Now this is the great archetypal, so to speak, event. It's the one from which all the others take their form and their model. The Israelites did nothing wrong in entering Egypt. In fact, they were welcomed there. But after a century or two, <clears throat> there arose a pharaoh who determined to exterminate them by genocide. And the result was the exodus. And the exodus from under the leadership first of Moses and then of Joshua takes them back to the promised land, but this time the economy is more of an agricultural one. They are promised a land flowing with milk and honey, and neither of those is a vegetable product, but uh, the symbol of the promised land when they get there is a big bunch of grapes. And we are told that with some reluctance they settle down to a an agricultural life uh, dependent on the crops and on the harvest and vintage. And the crucial event of the Exodus was the crossing of the Red Sea. The Israelite got across, the Israelite got across it safely, but the Egyptian army pursuing them was drowned in it. So the demonic image of the sea recurs in the story of the Exodus, and that is followed, of course, 
by wandering of 40 years in the wilderness. And then there follows the period covered by the judges and eventually <coughs> the Israelites find themselves in bondage to many of the surrounding kingdoms of which the most powerful and important were the Philistines. The Philistines were probably a Greek-speaking people from Cyprus, and they gave their name, somewhat ironically, to Palestine. And <clears throat> by this time, we are getting towards the period of the Trojan War, which is a legendary reconstruction of a period of history in which the Egyptian Empire was declining and were constantly being attacked by sea pirates, uh, most of whom were, Greek, were, were allied to the Greeks. And uh, the armor of the Philistine giant Goliath, which is described in the book of Samuel, is rather like the armor of a Homeric warrior. So we're roughly around the period 12 to 1100 BC. And then this is followed by a renewed prosperity where the great leader is David. And David's son Solomon, the two together, <clears throat> give you the first period of prosperity and independence. Now here the imagery shifts to urban imagery cities. The great feat of David from the biblical point of view was his capture of the city of Jerusalem and making it the capital of his kingdom. And so Jerusalem becomes the central image of this phase of Israelite history and then his successor, Solomon, built the temple on Mount Zion. Solomon is a curious example of the, the way in which <clears throat> legend and history are interwoven in the Bible. Uh, the historical Solomon was not a wise man, but a weak and foolish and extravagant man who spent seven years building the temple, 13 years building his own palace, and then at the suggestion of some of his 700 wives amiably built two or three more temples to other gods. Well, historically, that's, that's fair enough. Solomon was probably not a monotheist at all, but uh, the memory of his taxation for all these buildings was very bitter and not long after his death, when his son proposed to continue his policies, he instantly lost ten-twelfths of his kingdom, and it split into a northern Israel and a southern kingdom of Judah. After that, it was only a matter of time until we reach another captivity, Assyria, the, the great Assyrian war machine, rumbled across Western Asia and destroyed the Northern Kingdom around 722. And uh, <clears throat> the Southern Kingdom, Judah, had a respite for a little while, but eventually King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came and sacked Jerusalem and the Israelites, now the Jews, were carried away into captivity in Babylon. The Babylonian captivity lasted about 70 years, and then, of course, Babylon itself was destroyed by the power of Persia. And the first great king of Persia, Cyrus, one of the 
few authentically great men of the ancient world and a tremendous legendary figure both in Greek literature and in the Bible um, permitted, in fact, according to the Bible, encouraged the Jews to return and rebuild their temple. There are two returns that are prominently featured in the Bible, one of them towards the end of the 6th century, around 516 BC, and a later one, about a century later, under Ezra and Nehemiah. There were probably other returns, but symbolically we need only one return, and it focuses on the image of the rebuilt temple. Now, there follows something of a blank. The consecutive Old Testament history stops with the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC, and we have only fragmentary glimpses of the Persian period. But you remember that the Persian Empire was destroyed by Alexander the Great, who gets very little attention in the Bible, although the great biblical historian Josephus has him welcomed into Jerusalem by the high priest with many expressions of mutual esteem. But Alexander's empire, of course, fell apart instantly after his death, and Judah was eventually attached to the largest chunk of it, the Seleucian Empire with its headquarters at Syria. And <coughs> finally, around 165 BC, there arose the persecution of the non-Hellenized Jews by the king of Syria, whose name was Antiochus. And he gave himself the name of Epiphanes, which means the glorious. But when he wasn't listening, his courtiers altered it to Epimenes, the lunatic. And uh, Antiochus seems to have regarded the Jewish religion as a personal insult, and uh, his persecution was so ferocious that it provoked the rebellion of a man of the priestly tribe of Levi, whose five sons, all of whom were very actively engaged in the rebellion of Israel, are known as the Maccabees. And eventually the Maccabees gained a certain degree of independence for the country and Perhaps the most important event symbolically was not so much the rebuilding of the temple as the purification of it. Uh, <clears throat> what Antiochus had done that was particularly outrageous to Jewish feelings was to put a statue of the god Apollo in the Holy of Holies, the most sacred part of the temple, which was invisible because because uh, God is invisible. And on the anniversary of this sacrilege, of this pollution of the temple, the, the temple was purified by Judas Maccabeus. And that lasted until the legions of Rome, headed by Pompey, again came rolling over from Asia Minor and entered Jerusalem in 62 BC. And that is the historical situation that we meet at the beginning of the New Testament. And
In 70 AD, <coughs> Jerusalem was sacked and looted by the Emperor Titus, and in 135 AD, the Emperor Hadrian expelled all the Jews from their homeland and changed the name of Jerusalem to a, a Latin name, Aelia Capitolina, and simply eradicated all geographical traces of the Jewish people. At this point, Jewish and Christian versions of this U-shaped narrative diverge. The, the Christian one is that Jesus came to achieve the, all these symbols of peace and prosperity in a spiritual form in the Jewish belief that has still to happen and there has to be also a literal return of the Jewish people to their homeland. There any questions that far? Well, it's the up and down thing when you're looking at it from the point of view of Israel. But if you're looking at it from the point of view which Israel took of everybody else, then you would get a series of inverted U's. And that would be something of a cyclical movement. That is, that would be a sequence of empires rising and falling one after the other. The Egyptian one the Philistine one, the Assyrian, the Babylonian, the Persian, the Macedonian, the Syrian, and the Roman. The first return which was directly after the, the uh, fall of Babylon, was led by a leader named Zerubbabel, who, has, who was descended from the line of David. And so symbolically, he becomes a very important figure. And the prophecies, the, uh, the minor prophets Haggai and, and Zechariah, are connected with that period of history. But we don't know exactly what happened. They're, the references are too fragmentary and too oblique. Well, now, if we look at these, at this manic depressive chart, um, we notice that symbolically there is a certain affinity between all the categories on the top. They are all symbols for the home of the soul, for the ideal situation of human life. Similarly, all the, all the categories at the bottom are recurring symbols of the bondage and tyranny of human history. So, the next thing we have to do, we've been dealing with the principle of myth at some length, is to invoke another principle, which is the principle of metaphor. Now, the principle of metaphor is the grammatical figure which says, this is that. If you look at 49th chapter of Genesis, which is Jacob's prophecy of the 12 tribes of Israel, you will find a number of metaphors of that kind. Joseph is a fruitful bough. Naphtali is a hind let loose. Issachar is a strong ass. 
Dan shall be a serpent in the way. Now that is the grammatical form of the metaphor in which the, there are two categories, A and B. They are said to be the same thing, although they remain two different things. Therefore, the metaphor is illogical, or more accurately, it is insane. That is, nobody can take metaphor seriously except the people mentioned in the speech of Theseus in the Midsummer Night's Dream, the lunatic, the lover, and the poet. And the Bible is so full of metaphors because it is so intensely poetic. And and we'll find later how many of the images of the Bible and how many of the central doctrines of the Bible even are the central doctrines of Christianity evolving from the Bible can be grammatically expressed only in the form of metaphor. In the doctrine of the Trinity, for example, one equals three, or one is three, and three are one. And the doctrine of the real presence is that the body and blood are the bread and the wine. Jesus, in Christian doctrine, is man and God. All of these are metaphorical in grammatical expression, and they are all statements that completely transcend, or whatever they do, the world of logic. In logic, A can only be A, it can never be B. There's a rather significant verse in the, in the New Testament that indicates that. We are told in the New Testament by Paul and others that the Bible has to be understood spiritually, pneumaticals. And the word spiritually means a good many things in the New Testament. But one thing it always means and always has to mean is metaphorically. In the book of Revelation, I forgot to bring my Bible in with me, but I can remember the verse. It's Revelation 11, 8. Uh, we are told of a martyrdom of two witnesses at the, in the last day. It's one of the prophecies of what is going to happen at the end of time. And the verse reads, their bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. That is, spiritually, metaphorically, Sodom, Egypt, and the earthly Jerusalem are all the same city. And similarly, in the symbolism of the Bible, Egypt, Babylon, and Rome are all symbolically the same tyranny. And the Pharaoh of the Exodus, the Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, and the persecuting Caesars of Rome, of whom Nero is particularly the type, are metaphorically or spiritually the same person. <clears throat> but, of course, they are the same person in a way which does not commit you at all to any literal belief in reincarnation or 
there's that man again. That is Antiochus and Nero and Nebuchadnezzar and the Pharaoh of the Exodus are all spiritually the same person. And similarly, the Garden of Eden, the Promised Land, Jerusalem and the Temple on Mount Zion are all interchangeable, spiritually, the same image of the soul's ideal and the soul's home. And the, re the reason why this conception is so centrally important in the Christian Bible is that Jesus continually talks about his spiritual kingdom, which he makes quite clear has nothing to do with overturning the Roman Empire. And uh, that is why that word is so much stressed in the New Testament. Okay. I wouldn't say that this pattern was cyclical. The Bible doesn't like cyclical views of history, and the reason why it doesn't is that a cycle is a machine. And a cyclical view of history means a machine turning, something impersonal. And it's part of that perverse tendency on the part of mankind to enslave himself to his own inventions and his own conceptions. Man invented the wheel, and so in no time at all, he's talking about wheels of fate and wheels of fortune as something that are stronger than he is. That's the Frankenstein element in the human mind, which is part of original sin. And the Bible, while its, view, while its approach to history is a very oblique one, nevertheless has a very strong, even passionate, historical interest and historical sense. And in history, as you know, nothing ever exactly repeats. <clears throat> Every situation is a little different, but what happens is a kind of growing consolidation of these images so that the image of the final restoration of mankind, which you get in the book of Revelation, is not a simple return to a simple Garden of Eden, but incorporates the imagery of cities and of harvests and vintages as well. Would you say that there's a progression in these stages that, for example, the temple, the image of the temple incorporates the five points of the garden of Yes, I think that that at every phase you get a new aspect symbolically of the, of the uh, ideal human life, which is first thought of as a, as a garden where a man lives entirely on tree fruits, and then as history goes on incorporates these elements of human work, these elements by which man transforms his environment into something with a human shape and a human meaning. And with the conception of the rebuilt temple, you have the element of time added to that. It becomes something that, that takes place in time as well as in a conceptual space. Oh, yes. If he'd overthrown Rome, he'd have become a Neo Nero. Yes. But in a sense, he did something different. So that's sort of a breaking away from the pattern. 
Well, what he does is not so much something different as a return to these categories here, but a return to what they express, as the Bible says, spiritually, as, as elements of, the, uh, of a human ideal or a human vision. Um, I don't mean individual or subjective, no. No, the, the word spiritual is something which normally we approach in a rather individual and subjective way, but there's a very strong social interest, which is part of its historical interest, in the Bible and in the New Testament particularly, where... Uh, when St. Paul, for example, speaks of a moment of private illumination that he had at the end of the second letter to the Corinthians, he is extremely apologetic about it and uh, talks about boasting, which is something he dislikes doing, and uh, also talks about it very vaguely. He's not sure whether it happened to him or to somebody else. And uh, what he what he's thinking of, I think, there is that a religion which is aimed purely at individual illumination is something of a cop-out. And what he is trying to proclaim, is the gospel is teaching, is a, is a social and a revolutionary thing as well. He wants the world to wake up, not, uh, not individuals here and there. 